This is the new Rimac Nevera, and it's the latest hypercar in a world increasingly filled with hypercars. But this one might just be a game changer. It has almost 2,000 horsepower. It does zero to 60 in around two seconds, and it's all electric. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era, now with free listings. You can list your car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And we've had some great sales recently, including this Audi S4 RS4 Avant clone, which sold for $75,000, this Scion FRS with a 2JZ swap that sold for over $20,000, and this fantastic Porsche Cayman, which brought more than $55,000. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, check out Cars and Bids with a great selection in daily auctions at carsandbids.com. Now, I've borrowed the Nevera from Rimac and from Rimac Beverly Hills, which will be the Rimac dealership in Beverly Hills in the Los Angeles area. And yes, you can place an order for a Rimac if you want. Thank you very much to Rimac and Rimac Beverly Hills for letting me check out the amazing Nevera. You can find out more about both by clicking the link in the description below. So let's talk Nevera because its numbers are truly amazing. 1,877 horsepower. Yes, that's right. Zero to 60 in under two seconds, which makes it faster than a Bugatti Chiron or any other hypercar for that matter. And then there's the price tag. This will start around $2.4 million. And then there's the brand itself, which you might not be too familiar with. They're called Rimac and they're Croatian. Now, Rimac has become well known lately for this amazing car, but also for their joint venture partner partnership with the Volkswagen Group. Porsche owns a portion of Rimac, and in turn, Rimac owns a controlling stake in Bugatti. So this isn't just some upstart car company you're never going to hear from again. Indeed, I suspect you'll be hearing a lot about Rimac and the Nevera in the coming months and years, as this car shatters production car speed and performance records. This car is also scheduled to start deliveries by the end of this year, 2021, and Rimac says they're only going to build 150 units for the entire planet, making this especially exclusive. And today, I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a tour of the Nevera and show you all of the interesting quirks and features of this insane electric hypercar. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features of the Rimac Nevera by getting inside. And this is usually the part where I show you the weird and interesting key, but unfortunately this is a pre-production car and that means there is no key. It also means that this car isn't completely production ready and finalized. So there are a few other details throughout the car that aren't quite finished basically. And I'll remind you of that as I show them to you. But for now, it means no interesting key to check out. But we can look at the door handle situation. You walk up to the car and you see no immediate immediately obvious door handle, but if you reach your hand into this like little air intake area, there's a little door handle underneath here, and you just press it and then open up the door, which of course opens upwards like a true hypercar door should. And next up, before I climb inside, one cool thing that you can see right here, this car has a carbon fiber monocoque, which is pretty common among hypercars, supercars, but in this car, it's not just the tub that's carbon fiber, it's like the entire skeleton. And you can see where the carbon fiber actually goes over the interior and in the passenger compartment, that's all structural, and it makes this car tremendously rigid. In fact, Rimac says is that this is the single largest piece of carbon fiber in use in any vehicle in the car industry, this giant carbon fiber monocoque that basically serves as the backbone for this entire car. But anyway, next up you climb inside the Nevera and you're greeted by some rather interesting items in here. Possibly my favorite is the dials that you can adjust that are very forward facing, kind of right in your face. One is to the left of the steering wheel and this dial is very important because when you push it, it turns on the car. You can see you press and 
it says start and then the car is going. You press it again and it stops and that sort of stops the electric motors from being, I guess, in a drive ready state. Now this dial is also really important because you can twist it and that will go through the different gears in this car. Park, reverse, neutral and drive. As you twist the dial, obviously you can see it goes into each gear and then activates reverse, neutral, drive, etc. But probably the more interesting dials are the ones in the center. When I first saw a picture of this interior, I assumed that these would be like climate controls, but they are not. The one closest to the driver, that adjusts the drive mode that you're in. You can twist it and you can see you can go between all of the different drive modes that this car offers. Now, interestingly, when you select each different drive mode, it changes like the entire interior color on all the screens to correspond with the different drive modes that you select, which sort of changes the ambiance to correspond with each individual drive mode. There are also two configurable drive modes in here where you can choose how you want the car to behave if you want it set up a certain way to your liking. And next up, an important point behind the main drive mode dial there, there's actually a second dial and it's sort of hidden, but it also has a function. You can use this second sort of backup dial to adjust the traction control, the stability control, and the torque vectoring system in this car, which will sort of break the inside wheel in turns in order to get you through faster and give you better handling. All that stuff can be adjusted with the sort of secret second dial back here. Over on the right, your second center dial screen situation, this allows you to control the torque split for the electric motors. Like I said, four electric motors in this car. There's one at each wheel, and you can dial exactly where you want all the torque to go by using these dials. The one closest to you adjusts the torque split for rear power, and of course the one in front adjusts the front power, and you can dial the torque split however you want. You can make this car 100% front wheel drive if you want to, or you can send all the power to the rear wheels if you really want to go drifting. You can turn off any torque going to the front wheels, or you can make it fully four wheel drive. You can choose basically any drive mode setup you want, thanks to the electric motors at each wheel. Now, some other interesting items in here. One is the door handles to get out. You can see them on the door panel. It's this thin little strip that says Rimac, and you can put your finger sort of behind that and pull, and that will open the door. That is a pretty sleek and cool looking door handle. You don't always see such a thing. Next up, another interesting item in this interior is the cameras mounted in here. You can see a camera mounted between the seats facing forward, and then a second camera mounted ahead of the driver's seat sort of facing the driver. These cameras have two interesting purposes. One, they can record your laps. So you're driving this thing on a racetrack, you can record your laps. The one between the seats records the road, and the other one records like the driver's movements or whatever, and then you can watch your laps later and see like where you maybe screwed up or where you did well, whatever, and that is pretty cool. But there's also a second purpose to these cameras. Rimac tells me that the one facing the driver will be able to have a facial recognition technology, and that means when you climb inside the car, it will recognize if the person driving it is someone who has like a profile setup, and then it will configure everything to your liking. The position of the steering wheel, the seats, whatever, it'll configure it all with the facial recognition. So in theory, gone are the days where you have to like set up a driver profile to correspond to a key. You get in this car and it'll just know who's behind the wheel. That's pretty cool. Next up, another interesting item in this interior. Between the seats, this little panel pulls out and reveals cup holders, which is nice to have in your two and a half million dollar hypercar. Rumac told me that these cup holders were tested at speed. So if you want to carry a drink on the racetrack, you can stick them in the cup holders and then maybe they won't spill. That's kind of cool. Probably not too many cars have speed tested cup holders, or at least at this car's speeds. Another interesting thing in terms of storage is the glove box, which isn't really actually a glove box. You pull on this little tab and it opens more of a glove leather portfolio where you can stick papers and that sort of thing. In fact, storage is not exactly this car's strong suit as you might expect from a hypercar. The center compartment is also for storage, but it's not very deep as you can see. And there's a wireless cell phone charger in there that takes up most of the space. So even if you wanted to store items in there, you really just get a phone in there and maybe a little bit more, not much storage in there. Now, next up, speaking of the center console in this car, one very prominent feature of this interior is this switch panel in the center console, just below the center screen. There's a group of like seven different switches that control different things. On either side of the switch panel, 
panel, you have your window control. As you can see, you push it down and then the window goes down. And of course you pull it up and the window goes up. That's pretty simple. Now to the right of the driver's window control, there's a little car with arrows. That is your axle lifter system. So you press that and then the axle lifter will lift the car up so you can clear like low curbs or whatever since it's a pretty low car. Again, fairly common in exotic sports cars. Now over on the right side of the switch panel, you can see two fairly self-explanatory switches. You have a lock button, which is the door locks, lock or unlock. You can toggle it either way. And you also have a fog light here. So you can turn on, I think this is the rear fog light, which you might need in foggy conditions. The other two switches in this switch panel control the infotainment screen. I'll get back to them in a second, but I do want to go through this screen. Now, again, Rimac cautions me, this car is not a production model. This screen is not finalized yet, especially like the reaction time that it has. It will improve for production, but I have to say there's a lot of cool stuff already in this screen. For one thing, you go into the home screen, you can see that the main home screen shows like some car data over on one side and the other side there's a map and it has kind of a cool look to it, sort of like futuristic and performancey and not necessarily like as every person friendly as a Ford or a Toyota screen. It's a little more aggressive and bold. But anyway, next you slide your finger over and you can see the next version of the home screen shows like what music you're currently listening to along with the map. And then you slide over one more time and you're given like a list of menu items that you can slide between and choose from. And so those are your main basic home screens in the Rimac infotainment system. Now worth noting, there is also another controller below the screen in the center console here next to the switches. You have a little pad. You can swipe your finger and that will swipe on the screen. But again, pre-production car, this isn't working, but of course you could see how it would work. And same deal next to the pad, you have a little dial. I assume this is going to be like a volume controller and it'll probably control some other stuff in the screen. Again, pre-production car not working, but again, you get the idea of what it's supposed to do and where it's supposed to be and how it's supposed to look. But as for the infotainment system itself and its functionality, a lot of it is just regular sort of normal infotainment workability, but there are a few cool items in here. For one thing, the climate control vents can be opened or closed from this screen. You go into the climate control area and you can press open and then that will close up the climate control vent and then it's closed and no air is coming out of it. If you want to reopen it, you just tap it again and then the vent reopens. So you don't have some like ugly switch on the vent itself that lets you open or close the vents. Instead, you do that in the infotainment screen. Next up, another cool feature of the screen, going back to those switches in the center, you have a little switch labeled control with the image of a profile of a car. If you press that, it pulls up a series of controls for the car. You can see the headlights are controlled through here. The dome lights are controlled through here. And also the trunk is controlled through here, which I'll show you in a little bit. But more interesting in this screen area over on the left, you can see sort of an image of the interior of the car with little touch points. And this is how you control various items in the interior, including the seats. You tap on the seat and you can see here, this is how you raise or lower the seat. It's how you move it forward or backward and how you move the backrest forward or backward, all controlled within this infotainment screen. Same deal with the mirrors. If you want to control the mirrors, you just tap on the icon of the mirror in this little car diagram, and then it pulls up the mirror and then you can move it left, right, up, down. And that's how you adjust the position of the mirrors in this car. And same deal with the steering wheel. You tap on the steering wheel in this car diagram and it pulls up the steering wheel controls. And again, you can move it up, down and in and out, tilt and telescope using only the controls in your infotainment screen. This is kind of cool. It feels sort of futuristic and it eliminates the needs for sort of ugly buttons kind of cluttering the interior. These controls that you don't use all that frequently are instead integrated into the infotainment screen. Now go back to the switches in the center and there's one other item in here that you can use to control the infotainment screen. There's a switch marked setup. And if you press that, it allows you to set up various different car features and primarily like drive mode stuff. And you can adjust the throttle response, smooth, direct, or aggressive. You can adjust the suspension here, the steering assistance, and various other pieces of like the driving experience can all be adjusted here to tailor the car's driving mode to your exact whims. Now in this setup screen, in addition to be able to control the drive mode, you can also use this screen to adjust the passenger screen. Yes, there is a passenger screen. You can see it over here, sort of below the airbag on the passenger side of the dashboard. And right now you can see it's displaying the current speed and like the amount of power that's being used in kilowatts over on the passenger side. So the passenger can just sit there and watch those things happen as you're driving around. And one cool feature of this screen setup, you see all these little dots in the passenger screen, sort of in the background of the actual displays. Apparently when you're going really fast in this car, those dots will start to 
expand and get like more excited to correspond with your acceleration and with your speed. And it's not just in the passenger screen where that will happen. You will also see dots in the center screen and they'll do the same thing. And eventually you'll have dots in the gauge cluster screen, which will also do that and sort of add to the excitement and the thrill of accelerating because the screens will all be like doing something to correspond with your acceleration. And that is a pretty cool touch. But anyway, that passenger screen, adjusting it in the center screen, it looks like you have the ability to change the widgets on the passenger screen. Right now it's grayed out and you can't change them, but maybe in the future you'll be able to change things. So it's not just like your speed readout and your power. You can maybe get various different pieces of information there if you're sitting in the passenger seat. And next up we move on to the last screen in this interior. That would be the screen in the gauge cluster, which you can see very high resolution screen showing a lot of different information at once. In the center of the screen you have your speedometer, as you might expect, all digital. And then below that you have what gear you're in, park, reverse, neutral, drive. Now from there the rest of the gauge cluster is basically split into two halves, left and right, that display various information. Over on the left side, it displays info kind of based on what drive mode you're in. For instance, if you're in the range mode, this car's sort of eco mode, it'll show you your consumption over your last little bit of driving. The left panel can also show you your drive mode that you've selected. As you go through them, you can see the drive mode is shown here in the left panel, which one you're in now. And if you have a door open, the graphic will show you which door is open and kind of point to it on this cool little image. Also worth noting, as you go through the drive modes, you will see when you're in cruise mode, a map appears sort of in the center of this gauge cluster screen to show you where you are. You'll be just cruising around. You might want your navigation system aid right in front of you. And there it is in cruise mode. Over on the right is the more important part of this gauge cluster screen. It shows a bunch of various different car items like your trip odometer, your tire pressures, that sort of thing. My favorite display here, though, is your real time torque. It actually shows the torque from each motor. All four motors, since they're individual, can generate different torque figures. And this screen will show them in real time as you're driving along. And that would be a pretty cool thing to monitor from sitting in the driver's seat. And to adjust this little screen over on the right, you have steering wheel controls. This little control here can move up or down through the various different menus in this center screen. And then this one in the bottom right that says X, if you press that, it'll like close out the screen so you can have a more simple gauge cluster experience. Now, speaking of of steering wheel controls. There are a few interesting ones in this car. One is the turn signals. You have little buttons to the left and right of the horn that control your left and right turn signals. Much like Ferrari and Lamborghini have, this is how you activate your turn signals. There's no like turn signal stocks in this car like in normal cars. Also controlled on the steering wheel, again, much like Ferrari and Lamborghini, you have your windshield wiper control over to the left here. And you also have your high beam control over on the left side of the steering wheel. You move this control like one way to flash the high beams and another way to turn them on permanently. Again, as many controls as possible on the steering wheel for the same reason Ferrari doesn't. So you're on the racetrack or you're driving fast. You don't have to like move your hands down and look down at something in the middle. Everything is right at your fingertips. Although it's worth noting that Rimac tells me this is not the finalized steering wheel design. They're going to change it and change the controls a little bit, which is important, I would say, because they're missing some stuff here, specifically volume. There's no volume control at all on the steering wheel, which is really, really important to have. Basically, every car has that. And I hope when they adjust this steering wheel, they do too. But one feature they do have, probably the craziest thing on this entire steering wheel, is a little button over on the left marked DC, which stands for Driver Coach. Now this feature isn't active yet, but Rimac says it's coming soon, and what it's going to be able to do is coach you on a racetrack in real time. And it's going to be able to help you in one of two ways. One, it will be able to take you on an autonomously driven lap. The car will come preloaded with a bunch of racetracks so it will know the best racing lines or you can drive it on your favorite racetrack and then it will learn the track and learn the best racing lines and then when you put it in this autonomous driver coach mode it can take you on the fastest possible lap so you can tell how you should be driving when you're driving yourself. That's pretty cool. Now the other way that driver coach can work, slightly less autonomous, is it can actually give you tips while you're driving like start braking now or turn turn in now or whatever. And it can give them to you through the speakers, the voice, or it can provide like little guidance on the gauge cluster screen while you're driving on the track to let you know, almost like a video game does. That's the plan for driver coach. So like I said, right now this system not functional, but Runex says it's coming soon. And if it really delivers on all that stuff, it'll be amazing for being able to drive as fast as possible on the racetrack. But anyway, next up we move outside the Nevera. And the first thing you notice when you come up to the car is the look on the outside and the doors 
specifically this door panel area here, which Renek says is the necktie design on the outside. And specifically, it's intended to recall neckties that were part of some old Croatian military uniform, apparently. And that is why it looks like this on the outside. In fact, Rimac is very proud of their Croatian heritage. You can see a plaque inside the car between the two seats tells you which number Navera you have, but also says that it was proudly like designed and engineered and produced in Croatia. You don't see a lot of Croatian built car plaques, but this is one of them. It's an amazing car, so they wanted to show off their heritage. Now, one interesting thing on the outside of this car, in terms of design, there's an amazing amount of like vents all throughout the side of this car, and they're all meant to channel air to various different places. Some bring air into the back to cool down all the mechanical components. Some are for aerodynamics, brake cooling, whatever, but there's a lot of different vents, and they all fit into the design surprisingly well. Usually when you see a car that's full of vents, you also have kind of a fussy design and that's not really the case here. This car, vents all kind of work with the overall design language, it's pretty good. Now, in terms of design, styling, I wanna talk lighting. Interestingly, the lighting in this car is pretty restrained. You can see the headlights on right now, nothing too crazy or interesting or weird here. And same deal with the turn signals. When they go on up front, you can see nothing particularly unusual or exciting about the design or the look of the signals or the lighting in front. And frankly, that's the same deal in back. You can see the taillights look, you know, kind of cool and interesting and unusual, but not like crazy aggressive or bold like some manufacturers are doing with their lighting these days and same deal with the turn signals in back again fairly simple fairly restrained in terms of overall styling design for the lighting and frankly that restraint is sort of a theme throughout the entire exterior styling of this car it's kind of interesting this is going to be the world's quickest accelerating production car ever and yet it just doesn't look like that aggressive or bold and frankly if I had to have one complaint about this car, that would probably be it. It doesn't quite have the same level of insane presence as like a LaFerrari or a Bugatti Chiron. It's just a little bit too restrained and maybe not quite bold enough, maybe not quite enough of a sense of occasion for this car compared to what it could be or maybe what it should be given the performance. With that said, there is something of a benefit here too. A lot of these upstart hypercar manufacturers want to create like the craziest looking car ever made and it comes off just overstyled and that certainly isn't the case here. But I should say inside and out, it maybe could use a little bit more like boldness or exciting or risks. I just feel like the design maybe isn't quite daring enough. And maybe that really is by design. Creating a fully electric hypercar is daring enough and maybe they didn't want to rock the boat any further by having a potentially polarizing design. I just frankly wish it was a little more. But anyway, with that said, there are a few cool and interesting touches on the outside of this car. One is unquestionably the spoiler. Right now you can see it's flat back here and it looks sort of sleek and elegant, but the spoiler's angle and position will change depending on what drive mode you're in. And you can see I go through the different drive modes and the spoiler reacts. It will raise itself and it will change its angle depending on what is best for that drive mode. And if you go into the drift drive mode, the spoiler will actually completely change its angle, I guess, to help facilitate drifting, which is kind of an interesting idea. It's also kind of strange that a hypercar has a drift drive mode, but the Rimac does. A couple of other interesting things on the outside. For one, you can see cameras mounted on the side of the car. A lot of times side cameras are mounted on the mirrors, but in this case, the mirrors are carbon fiber. They stick out, probably can't get cameras integrated in there, so they're mounted here instead this car has a 360 degree surround view camera system so when you're like backing up whatever you can see around the car very easily so you don't damage it and next up another interesting exterior feature maybe the quirkiest feature on the outside of this car is these little lights on the side sort of behind the door these little strips of light the intent here Rimac tells me is to have these lights turn on when the car is accelerating so as you're going faster these lights will sort of light up to signify to drivers around you look Look at this fast car go sort of like making it even more exciting and fun than just watching it take off you can also watch the lights turn on but Rimac says that isn't finalized yet because they're trying to assess whether having lights that turn on like that is legal and in compliance with regulations in all markets so they haven't yet decided if the lights can do that but if they are able to make the lights work that way Rimac says they're gonna make the color customizable even to the point where you can put like your country's flag colors on the lights and then they'll light up like that or you can make them yeah, yellow or blue or whatever color you want, which will be kind of cool. Also, these lights will turn on when the car is charging to signify its percentage charged. And so they light up a little bit as the percentages go by. So you know when your Nevera is fully charged. 
And by the way, with those little lights on the side, one other hidden Easter egg, currently the car is programmed to light up those lights when you switch drive modes. Right now you're in drift mode, and this is what the lights look like when you're in drift mode. So there's actually an exterior way of showing other drivers that you're in drift mode, which is kind of a cool touch. And you can see they sort of change a little bit as you change the drive modes, just sort of telegraph what mode you're in. You can see that from the outside of the car. And next up, another cool exterior detail with this car, a hidden little Easter egg on the rear glass back here. If you look very closely, you can see the words printed ice breaker, which is intended to be a little play on words since ice stands for internal combustion engine breaker. This car being fully electric, faster than all of its gas powered rivals. And so that little piece there is sort of a tiny little brag on the outside of the Nevera. One other cool exterior feature is when you get into the car, you can see the door sill is surprisingly narrow. This is in direct contrast to most other hypercars that have a lot of structure here and you kind of have to maneuver your way over and it's a little difficult to climb inside, but not the case here. Now, Rimac told me a lot of engineering had to go into this to make it so small, but the benefit is getting in and out is sort of like getting in and out of a normal car. It's pretty easy to do, not so in most of its hypercar rivals. And one other exterior item with this car that's interesting is the paint color. They call it Nevera Blue. Now, Nevera is a Croatian word describing a type of storm that they have, like a thunderstorm, which this car is sort of intended to have the same energy. And this blue is intended to be the color of the ocean during that storm. And I have to say, it's a beautiful color when you're looking at it in here inside, but you take it outside and it's especially gorgeous. The way the sun hits it, it's sort of like green pearlescent in some lights and dark blue in others. It's a really, really Really gorgeous and special color that is unique to the Nevera. And finally, I will finish up with the cargo area in this car. Now to get back here, obviously there's gonna be a button on the key fob, I have no doubt. You press it and this will pop open, or you can access it by going into the infotainment screen to the controls area and pressing trunk, and then it opens. And I love the function of this little screen button. You press it and hold it down to confirm you want the trunk, and the little circle like makes a full circle as it's waiting, and once the circle has reached, then the trunk pops open. But anyway, this little piece of glass is your trunk and you pop it open and you can see that well, it's not really all that large. This car is not all about practicality. There is a little cargo space back here, but nothing huge for like large suitcases. It's a lot like other hypercars, frankly, in the sense that it's somewhat practical, but not really. Now, it's also worth noting the front area is not more storage. You don't have like a front trunk in this car. It's all mechanical components in there. So the only storage you have is the few little parts of the interior, plus this cargo space in back. That is your Nevera storage. And so those are the quirks and features of the Rimac Nevera. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, here we go, driving the Nevera. This is <laughs> terrifying to an extent. They don't have that many working pre-production models, so I'm always a little bit scared to drive a car like this but uh, also very excited. So the first thing I notice when I get inside here, this is a nice interior. Kind of reminds me of Bugatti, frankly. Everything, is some of the hypercars, you know, they're more tuned for all out, like it's rough and tough and, this car feels pretty nice. The materials are nice, the touchscreen looks good. Everything is very nice and modern looking and, and luxurious in here. I do have good room, headroom, legroom, etc., so I can fit in here no problem. I'm gonna do what obviously everybody wants to do when they get in this vehicle, given the acceleration numbers, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna punch it, we'll see what happens. <laughs> wow. holy crap. Oh my God. Holy crap. <laughs> wow. Crazy, insane, insane. You know, one of my complaints with electric cars has generally been, yes, it feels good when you first slam on the accelerator, but then it doesn't, you know, that kind of drops off. I, this might drop off at some point, but I'm not feeling that. <gasps> Holy, oh my God, that's insane. Hard to even explain how quickly it's accelerating. Um, and it's unbelievable to hear kind of this like spaceship type sound like you would hear in like a 50s movie about UFOs or something. I just did the Model S Plaid, which was similar acceleration numbers to this car, probably a little bit slower. It, it also felt absolutely totally insane, but this has a little bit more of a sense of occasion. You're in this incredible special hypercar, etc. So many car enthusiasts are so quick to kind of brush off electric cars because they're like planet saving and the first few electric cars were little hatchbacks that looked ridiculous. They were egg shaped and it wasn't cool. And it, this, this is the type of car that is clearly proven that it is cool now. And if you don't have an emotional connection to an electric car, I get that, but you're gonna start. 
because it's cars like this that are really transforming electric cars, making them exciting and interesting. I mean, this car is faster than any of the other hypercars and it's completely electric. So if you want the fastest thing, you, you're gonna have to get on this electric car bandwagon. It really is quite something. And you know, sitting in here, you really have your, I mean, it's nice. Like you're sitting in here, it's like a rational and reasonable vehicle. You have some questions, obviously, about a startup kind of company. Is the car actually gonna be nice? Is it gonna do well? Is it gonna be rattly? And is stuff gonna look out of place? I don't think that at all. This totally looks like a, a good effort from a company that's been around and that's been producing cars. It looks like a like a real and reasonable, you know, produced vehicle, frankly. And, you know. <laughs> This car is like having a roller coaster that you personally have access to. It can do whatever you want. And I will say, unlike Plaid, the braking in this car is considerably, is great. The braking feels almost as good or maybe better than the acceleration. When I'm flooring it and, and then slowing down, I can feel very smooth, very linear braking, um, very confidence inspiring in here. Frankly, this entire experience is pretty confidence inspiring. I, I wasn't really starting to pay attention until Remag. There's a lot of these hyper car startup companies, you know, but then the Volkswagen partnership kind of showed up and it was like, okay, a company that I take seriously is taking this company seriously. So I should be paying attention. And now I'm sitting in this car and I realize this is actually a car, like it's not vaporware. It's not poorly done. It's not like, oh, in three years, we promise we'll be making something good. This is a, this is a well screwed together car and it feels nice and it feels good. And it's just, wildly fast. Definitely feels faster than Chiron for all you hyper car potential buyers out there. Now I will say driving the car over some rougher roads, obviously the ride is a little bit rougher to be expected in a car that's this sporty. You can dial different suspension settings apparently and kind of configure how harsh you need the ride to be or how soft or whatever. But at the end of the day, the carbon of the entire vehicle underneath basically is carbon fiber. That always lends to a little bit of a stiffer ride and obviously it's a hyper car. You're gonna expect a stiffer ride. The steering seems to be pretty quick, nice and responsive as you might expect. And I'll say, I've driven all of the hyper cars. I've driven the Bugatti and the Conan 6 and all that. And this to me feels faster and certainly the surge and the acceleration, the speed is, is crazy. You do miss the noise. For people who love that that noise, you know, Koenigsegg does an amazing job of really capturing that and making it all seem so legitimate and so real, which of course it is. And it, it, this car doesn't quite have that. That's one of the drawbacks of electric cars, but you win a drag race. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it one more time just because this car is, this car is a lot of cool party tricks, but to me, this acceleration is like nothing that most human beings have ever felt, truly. And... <laughs> I'll tell you, the first few times you do that, it's like scary, but after a while, it just becomes fun. It's interesting how that morphs uh, for me mentally. Personally, I'm starting to get excited for this new crop of electric cars. You know, I was a fan of the BMW i8 and nobody else was, but I liked the concept of an electric car being something more than a boring commuter car that, that, that kind of wasn't that great. And obviously that car didn't deliver like some of the modern electric cars do in terms of performance, but this car is proof that the future can be electric, the future can still be fun and frankly amazing. I mean, this is the most amazing performance you'll ever feel in a car. <laughs> and it's incredible. It really, really is unbelievable. And, and we're sitting in an electric car. It's gonna change the way that people think about how EVs are. And so that's the Ribac Nivera. This is an absolute monster, truly unbelievable performance levels. This is the very first all electric hypercar that I've tested, but considering how incredibly fast this thing is and what it's capable of, I strongly suspect all of the other hypercars will eventually follow suit in switching to electric power. If they do, they will have tough competition from this. Anyway, now it's time to give the Nevera a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I think that's the Nevera's big drawback. It just doesn't look daring or crazy enough. It's nice, but not especially memorable, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration is obvious, 10 out of 10. Same deal with handling, it's fantastic, and it gets an easy 10 out of 10. Fun factor is huge with the combination of supercar handling and truly unbelievable acceleration, and it gets a 10 out of 10. And finally, cool factor. This is one of the coolest and most talked about cars in existence right now, and it gets a 10 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 47 out of 50. Next up are 
of the daily categories and features. Now, the Devera I drove was a pre-production car that didn't have everything working yet. I'm giving it a 7 out of 10, but that's based on Rimax promises coming true, including its great driver coaching system. If that stuff doesn't make production, this score could drop. Comfort, normal for a car like this, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Quality is good, the interior is nice, but I do worry about long-term reliability with a first real attempt car like this from a new brand, and it gets a 6 out of 10 until it can prove itself more. Practicality is actually good for a car like this. It has a lot of the same practicality drawbacks as other hypercars, but electric power is a nice benefit, so it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, value, and this car is insanely expensive at two and a half million dollars, but it's also the quickest accelerating car on the planet right now, and it's an amazing disruption in the world of hypercars. So it gets a seven out of 10 for a total daily score of 25 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 72 out of 100, which places the Nevera here among other hypercars and against the Tesla Model S Plaid. A few cars beat out the Nevera overall, and it's tied with a few others, but ending up in this company is a huge deal for Rimac. The Nevera is a seriously excellent effort at a hypercar. It's among the best, and it's innovative, exciting, and seriously fast. <laughs>